Hello and welcome to the Sonic Cinema Podcast. My name is Brian Scuttle and thank you for joining me at www.sonic-cinema.com. Today uh, we begin what I uh, am dubbing my Class of 99 series of the Sonic Cinema Podcast. Uh, I'm taking the time to look at individual films from the 1999 movie year, which I think is one of the most creatively exciting and movie years of our lifetime. We're going to talk about a lot of movies that um, were really well known at the time, as well as maybe some uh, more obscure films that uh, didn't necessarily get the appreciation and long-term appreciation that uh, others had. And we're going to start that off tonight with a discussion with myself and Chris Esper on the uh, Milos Forman biopic on Andy Kaufman, Man on the Moon, starring Jim Carrey. Uh, we we both have some interesting thoughts on this and some interesting info on Andy Kaufman, how we feel about it in regards to how it works as a film, uh, how it works as a biopic, and uh, more. So please welcome me, <coughs> Chris Esper, to the show to discuss Man on the Moon. I'm pleased to be joined today by writer-director Chris Esper, and uh, we've talked a lot about different multitude of films, not just his own, but also uh, different works on uh, of Scorsese, Truffaut, uh, Michael Cimino, and Heaven's Gate, as well as Andrei Tarkovsky. Um, today, he is. Uh, I'm. I'm glad to have him as part of and actually probably going to be the uh the debut episode of something that I want to do uh in 2019 with the podcast which is um sort of a retrospective look at the uh movie year of 1999 which was probably one of the most uh creatively significant uh film years in my life certainly in Chris's life as well as a lot of different filmmakers. Uh, we're going to touch on a lot of different films uh, from this year. The one that Chris and I were are going to be discussing first, we've got another one that we're going to do later, is uh, Milos Forman's uh, biopic of the comedian Andy Kaufman, uh, Man on the Moon. Chris, thank you very much for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me, Brian, as always. Before we get into the film, what is your um, what is your history as far as Andy Kaufman? Uh, as far as uh, Andy Kaufman goes, um, I um, I just dis- I discovered him uh, I discovered him uh, through the fact that I was a wrestling fan as a teenager, and um, I um, I have learned through being a wrestling fan that he he did a skit where he wrestled a woman or whatever and I and I thought, wow, that's so unusual and <laughs> weird. I have to I have to I have to check this out. And so yeah. I did. And and then I discovered that he was also a television star on the show Taxi. And I was like, oh I was like, oh a wrestler that was on a TV like I on a TV show. Okay, all right, interesting. Uh it was really the first it, like I learned it was the one like the first celebrities that went into the wrestling uh, arena and I was like, mm, okay, interesting. So then I started to look into his work a little bit more. At first I didn't really quite get what he was trying to do. I was like, I was like, wait, I was like, wait, so is this real? Is it not real? And I, 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 I couldn't really, I couldn't really put my finger on what, what it was. I really wasn't getting. And then I saw the movie of uh, man, on the moon. And I was like, okay. So, you know, it kind of opened up my eyes a little bit more and, and I quickly became a, Andy Kaufman fanatic. Uh, right. Uh, so, so went beyond the wrestling uh, for me. I mean, I don't really even watch wrestling anymore, really. I, did, mm. I haven't watched it since I was a teenager. Yeah. But, um, but Andy Kaufman as a performer, he just defied uh, what what it, uh, what performance is versus reality and all these other surrealistic ideas, uh, and so. I was very fascinated by that. And then seeing the movie, while it isn't accurate in a lot of ways, and there's a lot of stuff that isn't quite correct about his lifetime, yeah. there is there is a thematic idea 
of the the idea of the boy who cried wolf in a way where you know he is someone that uh said a lot of things and did a lot of pranks uh, yeah. if you will lack of a better word uh and then at the end of the day he himself was going through something very serious health wise mm-hmm. nobody believed him and that and it came to bite him back in a way and so that so that theme of the movie really fascinated me plus you know it's jim carrey it's Milo's Foreman, so Mm-hmm. I of course I of course I wanted to see it for those reasons as well, yeah. but it came, but that's sort of how I became an Andy Kaufman fan uh, was through those avenues. Mm-hmm. Well, and in addition to Jim Carrey and Milos Forman, who are obviously two of the big uh, creative forces behind the film, the other the other one I th- I would include is the writing team of Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski, who yeah. had just come off of People versus Larry Flint, who had just come off of yep. Ed Wood. And so yep. this is another um, example of them basically taking an interesting perspective on and wanting to tell the story of a singular individual that you wouldn't necessarily... Uh, and, I mean, Andy Kaufman's fascinating. I mean, I... I my first interaction with him, I think really my only interaction with him for a while was uh, Taxi, which was a show that my parents enjoyed watching, and sure. my my mom wasn't really a big fan of his, and so I but the name always rung a bell with me, and I mean I enjoyed watching Taxi and stuff like that. Yeah. So and this is this was a movie. So when when Man on the Moon came out. I was interested primarily for uh, Alexander and Karaszewski writing the script because I loved Ed Wood. Yeah. I loved People vs. Larry Flint. And right. uh, also Jim Carrey because this, is, this, this occupies that moment where Jim Carrey really started to try to take a more serious uh, path in yes. his career. Yep. And one of the things that I really appreciate and notice when another friend of mine and I discussed the Truman show earlier this year is that those first projects of that he took to be sort of more serious and more respected, I guess you could say were films that they were still the films themselves, the, the material themselves is is very much still in his comedic wheelhouse. It's just yeah, like turning that perspective just over a notch a little bit. Yeah, and you know, I I, I, I agree. wish it, and I wish I had, uh, I wish I had actually uh, gone back to revisit uh, Jim and Andy: The Great Beyond, the amazing documentary that came out last year, where we really got for the first time a look of Jim Carrey doing Man on the Moon and how he embodied Andy Kaufman on a regular basis. And yep. in the filmmaking of that, and that was a fantastic documentary of his. And it's like, it, it really shows just how personal being a part of the, a story to tell Andy Kaufman's uh, life, his story, what how important that was for Jim Carrey. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, have you seen his um, his audition tape for um, for the role? I can't remember. Was it in the? Uh, I can't remember. Did they show that in the great in the great beyond? They Andy? showed it. Yeah, they showed it briefly, uh, you, and you can also see the full thing on YouTube. But uh, it's really fascinating to watch because he takes moments that are. Um, that that Kaufman himself actually did on various shows and things like that, literally recreates it. It's like it's like scary accurate <laughs> when you watch it. Uh, so yeah, so no, so, so yeah, he was very much dedicated to the role in a big, 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 big way. Yeah. Um. So um. And, and, and like you mentioned, the Truman Show, which is also fantastic. Uh. But, uh, yeah, I think Man on the Moon was definitely the transition for him because th- this was also at a time when, you know, he, uh, I think the year prior to that, uh, well, he did Liar Liar, of course, but the year prior to that, I should say, 
did the cable guy, yeah. which, for, which for many, that was like a huge, weird departure that many didn't really like. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that they did Truman Show and Man and Luke. And that really started the transition in Jim, in Jim Carrey's career where he was doing films like um, Turtle Sunshine or, yeah. you know, uh, you know uh, The Majestic even. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so I have, I have a feeling that this was a milestone for him, both personally and also... Uh, career-wise. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting to think, because I remember uh, Milo Forman's first choice on the film was Edward Norton, who he had worked yeah. with on Wilbur yeah. versus Larry Flint, and he really wanted Edward Norton to uh, do it. But um, obviously it was Carrie, and I think part of that was the studio won Carrie because obviously it was more bankable and stuff like that. But ultimately, I mean, I can't imagine... I can't imagine Edward Norton doing uh, Andy Kaufman. I, I can only no, see it as Jim Carrey. Um, yep, especially I, after yeah, watching Jim and Andy. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and I think even Nicolas Cage was also considered, which I can't see at all, uh, no. which I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, it's like I, Nicolas Cage is like Andy Kaufman that I'm sure there's going to be a biopic of him one day where... It's right. just <laughs> the craziest thing imaginable, but that's right. um, yeah. So yeah, I I can't see Nicolas Cage at all. I I can see oh, why no. he would want to do it because of the fact that I I don't doubt that he's hugely influenced by Kaufman in terms of his approach to acting. But yeah, yeah I yeah. I can't I can't see him in the role at all. Uh, that no, and, I, I mean Milo. No. It, whether you know whether Carrie was Milos Forman's first choice or not, I mean he was he was clearly the best choice for it. I think absolutely, yeah. I mean he Jim Carrey Jim Carrey puts on I I, I would say that his performance is probably better than the movie itself. Like I, his yeah. performance stood out to me in a in a big 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 way. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's it's. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you there. Where it's like the his movie elevates the film as is better than the film itself. The film itself is very much a conventional biopic. I mean, it, yeah, it really I is in a lot of ways very conventional, which is weird coming not only from Alexander and Karaszewski as screenwriters, but also coming from Milos Forman as a director who yeah. has directed some very odd birds and some brilliant birds too. Um, yeah. Directed one, one floor of a cuckoo's nest, one Oscar Cuckoo. for that. Yep. Amadeus, Amadeus. Yep. One Oscar for that was nominated for people versus Larry Flint and just is, is, was a fantastic filmmaker in his own right. And so I, I think I I completely see the appeal of, especially when you take it in context of those films in particular and the type of people he liked making movies about, especially when it came to America. But also, otherwise, it feels like a very strange choice for him. Yeah, I, I would certainly agree with that. Yeah, especially when you look back at his filmography prior to that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I, I will say though, it's like, you know, we, we do talk about, you know, that Carrie's film is, Carrie's performance is the best thing about the movie. It's like, I, I I think you, you get a sense of what the movie is going to be from that cold opening. And I haven't gotten that cold opening until I watched it recently for the podcast. And it's like, I completely forgotten about it. And it was yeah. such a, it was such a weird and funny way of yeah. the movie. It's really the only way that the movie could have opened. I think. I agree. Yeah, and that was like the... truly uh, respectful of uh, of Andy Kaufman. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that was the perfect way to open it. Uh, I, I, in seeing it again recently. Uh, I couldn't help but smile at it because it was just like it was a it was like a nice tribute while also um, being truthful to who Andy Kaufman was as a performer. Yeah, yeah, and um, 
one one of the things I, I I will say is like one of the things I do like about the film is that I I like that and it's it's one of the things that I'm not it's it's something that I'm also one of the things I really like about the film, but it's also something that I think kind of holds the film back is that even in showing his early days as a kid and stuff like that, it's like you show Andy Kaufman is so confident in what he does even if nobody yeah. really gets it. And so yeah. you either go along with it or you don't. And it's one of those things where it's right. like, it makes you wonder how, you know, it makes you wonder how much you're going to get out of this biopic. And that's one of the things that's, it, there, the tension in the film, I think, is so much about, you know, how much you are led into Andy's world and to a certain yeah. and it's all, it feels very surface and you don't really yeah. get deeper and deeper, but at the same time, really, I don't think Andy Kaufman would have it any other way. Yeah, I, I, would, I would, I would, yeah, I would certainly agree with that. Um, it's funny you mention that because upon the film's release, Andy Kaufman's father uh, and I think, uh, well, the whole family really, uh, they had said they had wished that they went into other areas of his life, such as his early days as a performer, what he was very avant-garde, very experimental, mm -hmm. uh, because it's sort of like, like his childhood, especially that's only seen a very, very quick glance. Yeah. Uh, and then, it, and the film just jumps ahead to when he was sort of the tail end of being a struggling comedian, but even that trajectory of being a struggling comedian to being a star, it's very quick in the film, almost yeah. too quick, uh, yeah. cause there was, there was a lot more to his life in the film, uh, than the film leads on, uh, and I, I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way, but it, it, there, it, it does take a lot of liberties and, and certainly, uh, glances over some of the more interesting aspects of Coffin's life as a comedian. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is, I mean, a lot, you can say this about a lot of biopics, that it's like, it's a lot of sort of greatest hits from a person's career. I mean, I, yeah. I think that's, I think that's one of the things that, in a way, it almost holds uh, Man on the Moon back, is that it's, that's how they approach Kaufman. So it's like, and yeah. I think that's, that's one of those things where it's like, you know, if they had gone deeper into uh, you know his early days as a performer's early life and stuff like that, I think if if there had been more of that as opposed to very much a uh, conventional biopic structure that er Alexander and Karaszewski, uh are going with, I because obviously they feel like the audience will want to get to what it's familiar with whether it's Saturday Night Live yeah. and the wrestling and sure. uh, the taxi. taxi and all of that stuff. Um, but at the same time, it, I mean, if you go, that's where, that's where the storytelling, you have to, you have to know the type of movie that you want to tell. And sure. I, I, I feel like they tell exactly. I, I feel like they make the movie that they wanted to make. You know, whether yeah. it's necessarily the best version of that movie is left to be seen. Yeah. I'm not sure that it's entirely so. And even, you know, like you said, even his parents and stuff weren't completely sure themselves. I mean, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Yeah, I I would certainly agree with that. I mean, I think that, uh, I think the movie still holds up really well. Obviously, yeah. I very much enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy it very much. You know, it's a, you know, it's, in a weird way, it's kind of an inspirational film, but, uh, uh, the, but, but, uh, I mean, it does the very thing that most biopics do, which is that they make the main character, or in this case, the celebrity or whoever, or whomever, they make them into, they, they get rid of all their flaws and they make them a totally, they make them a totally sympathetic hero, mm -hmm. which that's convention. I mean, that's, I mean, that's what every conventional screenwriting book tells you to do is that your character has to be likable and that's 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 all tried and true but you also have to accept the fact that even celebrities uh, or famous people 
have their flaws, and yeah. that has to be recognized uh, within the biotech. That's what makes it a compelling story. Because if you look at the movie, while we do see Andy Kaufman's conflicts, inner conflicts, we also see where his more demon side is. A lot of that is very much under the surface, almost to a fault. And yeah. like he looks like the way Jim Carrey plays him, and this is not against Jim Carrey. I think it's more. I think it's more in the writing and the directing, he, as a character, comes off as the boy next door, you know, good kid that never really grew up, which I'm not really sure that's who Andy Kaufman was. I feel like there was more to him than what the movie uh, lets on. Yeah, and I mean, especially when you consider, especially when you consider the character of Tony Clifton. I mean, that that would have been fascinating if, like, It'd be fascinating to see a story, a, a movie about him, or just a, a documentary about him, even that really went into tried to go into detail of well, what about this? Why would Kaufman be compelled to do something like this? Of having yeah. this grotesque character, where it's <sighs> like you you see him, you know. You see him obviously playing the character, but you also see him, you know, playing opposite uh, his his writing partner, played fantastically by Paul Giamatti in the movie. That's right. Uh, and one of Paul Giamatti's early uh, films that uh, he he really I really start to t- take notice of him. And yeah, and uh, you know what. What's the psychology? I mean, it's fantastic to see Kaufman and Clifton together. It's wonderful to see him sort of let George Shapiro, played by Danny DeVito, who was Kaufman's yeah. co co star on Taxi. Uh it's fascinating to see them um play that out and to see how that plays out to other people, but it's like Right. I mean, and to a certain extent, it's it's one of those things where it's like it's almost kind of a good thing that you don't go too deep into the psychology of it because it's like, well, you know, you don't necessarily want to lose the magic, I guess, and the the absurdity yeah. of what Kaufman did. Was yeah, Tony Clifton. But at the same time, it's like, you know. The, part of part of the point of doing a biopic, I think, is to try to understand a character better. And it's like, yeah, and I, and and it's funny you, you and you talked about like taking the shine off of off of a uh, character, you know, sort of getting rid of their sort of putting their flaws aside and stuff like that. Look at People vs. Yeah. Larry Flint that had the same writer, same director. But while yes, Larry Flint is the protagonist, it's like it's hard to see him overly sympathetic in that movie. Yeah. He's just very defiantly who he is. But right. the difference between that and between Man on the Moon, I think, is that it's easier to see it's easier to see the actual human being of Larry Flynn that is Andy Kaufman. I think that's one of the things right. that kind of holds Man on the Moon back. And it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, really, Jim and Andy almost probably gets you deeper into yeah. the psychology of Andy Kaufman than Man on the Moon does. Yeah, no, I, I would, I, yeah, I agree. I would, you know, I, 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 you know, I would argue that Jim and Andy is probably a better biopic of Andy Kaufman than Man the Moon is, yeah. <laughs> uh, but in, in some strange way, even though a lot of it focuses on Jim Carrey, but uh, yeah. you do, but you do learn more about Andy Kaufman in that uh, in that film that you do in in um, uh, in Man the Moon, uh, and it's funny you mentioned. Uh, that you like to see a a movie about Tony Clifton. Uh, it's funny you mention that because back in the early '80s, Andy Kaufman and Bob Zemuda, um, you know, who was played by Paul Giamatti, were making uh, had written a Tony Clifton biopic that was sort of in the vein that was sort of in the vein of This Is Spinal Tap, uh, oh, very wow. tongue in cheek, 
Yeah, very tongue in cheek. I read the script. It's I read the script. It's absolutely brilliant, and it was going to be made. But the problem was the studio. In the case, in this case, it was Universal. Universal Pictures weren't sure that Andy Kaufman could hold his own as a leading man in a motion, in a major motion picture. Right. So they put him, so they put him to the test by having him do Heartbeats, which oh, was wow. a movie with uh, which was a movie with him and Bernadette Peters yeah. playing robots that fall. That, oh, have you seen it? I have not seen it, but I've heard about it. <laughs> okay, yeah. So that movie was an absolute train wreck when it came out. Yeah. And so quickly, quickly ended his movie career. You know, he was thrown off the Universal lot, all of that. You know, it's really too bad because because mm-hmm. uh, that that script, uh, that could have been a comedy classic. It was, it was brilliantly funny. Oh, man. And thinking about the – well, in, in – and and yeah, thinking about that, that that would have been I I would I would love to see that. And it's like because I I adore this as Final Tap, and it's like I'm a huge fan of the Christopher Guest, uh, yeah, mockumentaries and all of that stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean just so just the idea of Kaufman doing a film about Tony Clifton in that vein is just that. Oh, that would have been so. I mean, oh yeah, and, it would matter on who directed it to ultimately bring it home, but it's like sure. it's fascinating to think of. You know, that would have been fascinating to watch, and it's like yeah, man, oh yeah, been, yeah, that would that, that's really missed yeah. opportunity. Oh, I know, yeah, and and uh, it, it's very when you read the script and you hear about the story of of the film, it's very telling yeah. as to as to what happened to Andy Kaufman ultimately and what, and what became. And it makes you question a lot of things. And what I, well, all right, so spoiler alert uh, for the film that I forgot made, but uh, in the Tony Cl- uh, the, the, the film was to be called the Tony Clifton story. And at the end, at the end of the, uh, of the, uh, at the end of the, of the script, Tony Clifton dies of lung cancer. Oh, and wow. Yeah. And you think, and like, and of course, Andy Kaufman died at the age of thirty-five yeah. from lung cancer. Yeah. At Cedar Sinai, and oh, oh yeah, the, oh yeah, the other detail: he dies in Cedar Sinai Hospital. Andy Kaufman died at Cedar Sinai Hospital. So it's like, hmm. <laughs> it, so it, it really gets the wheels turning there as to yeah. did Andy Kaufman did Andy Kaufman in fact fake his own death? Did he yeah. not? Was this all part of the? Was it just all pure? coincidence uh because it uh i remember reading the script i was like wait a minute and it's it's really kind of crazy you know and uh so 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 in that in that sense as well it also makes the film a very uh the film and movie a very curious uh study yeah oh absolutely and yeah that's 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 fascinating to it's fascinating to find out, and it's like, yeah, oh my word, that would have been that was such a <laughs> missed opportunity. But again, I'm yeah. going to go down to you know, I because that obviously that type of thing obviously would have been you know you need the right filmmaker to make it work. I mean, in the case of the this is Rob, this is Final Tap had Rob Reiner who was making his yep. directorial debut, and then Christopher Guest just went along with the. Uh, the the structure later and um, yeah it's but at the same time you also you you also wonder it's like i mean part of the reason this is spinal tap and the christopher guest movies work is because of the fact that like it's 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 not a straight script there's a lot while there are character details and all of that stuff Every the interactions and stuff like that are improvised. Everything is yeah. basically workshopped and improvised, and it's like so. The idea of like a fully scripted Tony Clifton movie, it's like, would that have really worked? And and I mean, yeah. obviously, it's like you wonder whether Andy Kaufman, and Bob Zemeto, will uh, realize that. Okay, we we've we've got to you know we we've got to do some different things here. It's like, and they probably could. They probably, I have no doubt, they probably will have pulled it off. But oh yeah, um, yeah. It's it's that's also the type of thing where it's like you you have to be very careful 
to not have that be overindulgent. And I think that's yeah. where, that's that's where the risk of something like that will have come into play. But oh man, that yep. that would have been such a that would have been such a uh yeah. been such a fascinating thing to watch. And uh, Oh absolutely. Yeah. Well and, and I think the other thing to consider too is would it have worked in the sense that um because bits like bits like Tony Clifton and the wrestling, all that, they work best in my opinion in small doses in very short amounts of time. Couldn't, you know, can that sustain an hour and a half runtime uh, yeah. or more? Uh, you know, and so I think that's the other thing to think about is, yeah, you know, in, in theory, that's a good idea, but how well would it have worked when you consider, like you said, the, the, uh, uh, the film being scripted and also the runtime of it. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's one of those things where it's like it, another thing that makes this a spell tap workout so well is that it's an in, it's an inversion of a very familiar structure. And yeah, the, the sort of rags to riches celebrity story, except this time it's basically you know it's it's basically or a musical biopic where it's like oh well what if the musicians are they're not stars. They're just sort of, they feel like they're stars, but they're just sort of like on the fringes and they're basically yeah. like very close to circling the drain. And it's like, that's another part of, that that makes that work. So it's like, yeah, it's that, that type of thing is great as it will have been. I mean, I, I can't help but think of uh, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, well, I mean, and I, I really like the Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. I think it's a very yeah. good film, but at the mm-hmm. same time, it, part of the reason that works is because of the fact that, again, you've got a familiar structure that you're putting an outrageous story around, yeah. and I think that's one of the things that make that work. Um, right. And yeah, it's it's. Man, so much of this is like, you know, we're Man on the Moon is I I, I think I th- I'm glad I'm glad Man on the Moon exists just for like this discussion because of the fact that it's, yeah. it's so fascinating to think about Kaufman as an individual and Kaufman's life and sort of what um you know, what it what impact it had. And I mean, everybody, you know, and I mean, you can tell just by Jim and Andy, just how much of an impact it had on Jim Carrey. And yeah, like I said, I, like we both, we both kind of agree that, I mean, that's arguably a more, that's arguably a better up close look at, uh, Andy Kaufman and the type of, right. the type of movie you would like to see about Andy Kaufman And part of it is because of the fact that, I mean, I think Jim Carrey had some distance from that part of his life when he made the movie that he was open to uh, revealing some of himself. Absolutely, yeah. And he had been through the journey he had been through. And it's like, you know, it's one of those things where it's like you, you... it's a shame that Andy Kaufman is no longer around to right. tell that story himself. And it's sort of right. left to us to and other people like Scott Alexander, Larry Karaszewski, Milos Forman, Jim Carrey, uh, Paul Giamatti, and Danny DeVito to sort of tell, fill in that blank, the blanks, or at least try to. Yeah. Absolutely. That that said, I mean, you know, it's like we're, you know, we there are some really great things about uh, Man on the Moon, and it's like there are some interesting things about Man on the Moon. Uh, I I think the scene where uh, Kaufman is telling everybody that he has cancer is probably as good as anything Jim Carrey has ever performed. Yeah, I yep. I think that's his. I mean, that's his sure sign of his maturity as a performer is even it goes beyond anything in the Truman show. Like the Truman show, oh, yeah. you, you still feel like even though, yeah, it's a more serious movie. You've got Peter Weir directing in stuff like that. 
it's still very much a Jim Carrey movie in a lot of ways. Oh, sure. Um, and it's still very much a Jim Carrey performance. Uh, but that scene in particular with him uh, telling everybody that he has cancer, he has cancer. the way they react on it and the way that he's trying to drive it home to them um, is as good as anything Carrie ever played. And I mean, this is, and that includes eternal sunshine of spotless mind, which I think is his best work. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I love that scene. I also love the scene where he is saying that he's a, that uh, to his, to his girlfriend, uh, that, uh, that, that she doesn't know the real him. Yeah. And she's saying, oh, you know, you know, she's saying, oh, you know, there isn't a real you, whatever. And like, that's <laughs> part of the theme of the movie. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's just, it's beautifully done. It's just such a beautiful, quiet moment, uh, for, for Jim Carrey as an actor. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and, and another move, and another scene in the movie that I completely forgot about, cause it had been a while since I had seen Man on the Moon. Um, yeah. is, uh, is the scene at the end where, you know, the, the cancer's taking a toll on him and he's sure. going to this, this shaman or somebody like that. Oh and, yeah. And you, you see him and you see the people lying up and stuff like that. And you kind yep. of, and he starts, he gleans something sort of like, breaking the illusion for him that this is something that's going to, you know, it, that they're, you know, it's like you kind of get the impression that the, uh, the, the person performing this ritual on him is just performing. It's not actually yep. that he's not necessarily going to cure anything. He knows he's not going to be able to cure anything. Yep. And yep. so, and you see that little recognition in, uh, Andy, it's just such a beautiful moment. Uh, oh, that's the the way yep. Carrie plays that. Yep, yeah, the, yeah. Just that the laugh that he gives, like you just get the sense, like without saying any words, you get the sense that Andy Kauf, the character of Andy Kaufman himself, has been uh, has been part of a ruse uh, yeah. himself. The, the much like how he did the same to his audience. That mm -hmm. it's it's a it's it's a sad moment while also being. But it, 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 it's said in a very ironic way uh, yeah. Yeah, when, when you yeah. culminate everything together. Yeah, it's a beautiful moment. I agree. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's just one of those things. Uh, Courtney Love, we, we didn't really talk about her. She plays uh, the girlfriend in the movie. Oh, that's right. And she had just been yep. coming off of People vs. Larry Flint, which she, she had gotten rave reviews for. You know, yep. she, she's good in the movie. She She's good yeah. for what the movie requires for her. Yeah, and, I, uh, I I I agree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's not quite as rich a role for her, I think is uh, the role she had in Larry Flint, and she you you know, and she's she's continued with acting, and you know, you've you've seen, you know, she's been in other stuff where she's done really well, good work in. Um, yeah. So it's, but yeah, I mean, she's she's good in the movie. Uh, yeah, and, she's good. I'm, yeah. It doesn't. Yeah, the problem is it's not her fault. It's it yeah. just the movie doesn't give the movie just doesn't give her much to do. There's nothing that's really asked of her mm -hmm. uh, to do, unfortunately. But for what yeah. she has to do, she does it very well. Yeah. And the uh, title of the movie uh, comes from the REM song "Man on the Moon," and Michael oh, yeah. Stipe had uh, Michael Stipe and REM. Uh, they wrote "The Great Beyond" for the movie. As well the movie, yeah. as uh, the score for the movie, which is really nice. It's a, it, it's yeah, based it's a, nice a lot score. on "Man on the Moon," the the original song and stuff like that. I I had forgotten that because this was this was it's actually kind of an interesting year for Michael Stipe in terms of '99 was because he had also uh, produced helped produce uh, being John Malkovich. Oh yeah. So it's interesting that um, he's he's sort of revealing himself as far as like his some of his inspirations and stuff like that yep. between uh, Man on the Moon, which you know if you'd heard the song years before, you kind of already knew. But oh, sure. Also, yep. you know the the foresight of having a foreman to have him write the music for it, which is really nice. It goes well with the film. Um, yep. Yep. And then you also see him producing something like being John Malkovich, which like 
you know, like Andy Kaufman, I mean, Charlie Kaufman's uh, work is something that is very much outside of the box at that moment. Yeah. And, uh, I, yeah, I, I know, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. And yeah, so it's, you, you start to, you, you see a little bit of another, you know, again, this is something that, like, is personal for Michael Stipe to be mm-hmm. bringing these films to life because of the fact, he'll bring these films to life because of the fact that, uh, you know, that's a, the type of person he is, too. Mm. That, and that's funny because I had no idea that Michael Stipe produced Speed Job Out of That's just another favorite of mine from, uh, from 1999. And, yeah. and, uh, and Charlie Kaufman is one of my, probably my favorite screenwriter that, uh, yeah. who, who, whose work I, I constantly go to again and again. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I had no idea he was part of, uh, B.J. Malkovich. Uh, so now that, that's, that's great to know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, I, I think we, we, you know, we both, we both agree that, um, Man the Moon overall, it's like, it's a really good film. It's, it's good, yeah. I, I think, and it definitely, it definitely added. It's it's a film that definitely adds something. I think even even if it's yeah. a great film about Andy Kaufman, it's like you right. you have you have things like Jim Carrey's performance that stand out. You have Paul Giamatti's great work yep. in the film that stands out. This is mm-hmm. really DeVito's probably best, some of his best work on screen. I think is George. Yeah, Taylor. I. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, and uh, it's really nice to see as well. Um, you know him. Um, it, it's nice to see him in there, especially given the history he had with Andy Kaufman on Taxi, yeah. and then you follow, then you follow up with the Taxi cast actually being there. Like that, you know, that, yeah. that's a nice nostalgic touch to it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I mean, you know, and then you have an after. You know, you have something that came much after, much longer after within. Jim and Andy, which just gives you even more appreciation to Jim Carrey's performance in the movie, but also yeah, who not only who Jim Carrey is, but who Handy Kaufman was, and yeah. being able I, to have that appreciation, I think ultimately is the point of a movie like Man on the Moon. I agree, yeah, and you know, and and I agree that while while Man on the Moon as a movie doesn't really dive into Andy Kaufman. I think to be fair, I think the only person I can make a, a, a movie about Andy Kaufman is Andy Kaufman himself. Ironically, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. it's it 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 it's one of the, he, Andy Kaufman. He was an enigma, and yeah. he's one of those people that you could get the best director in the world. That is a story that is ver- that's almost unfilmable, but they somehow managed to pull it off uh, in a in, in a moderately successful way. Uh, and Jim and Andy does it well in a different way. I think it, yeah. I think it takes out, I think Jim and Andy does an excellent job of taking all the existential feelings and views that Jim Carrey, especially Jim Carrey, but also Andy Kaufman both have and, and how both their existential views sort of interwine together. I mean, it's amazing how much, uh, how much a documentary shows how close they are in a lot of ways, I mean, you know, I mean, they even have the same birthday, for God's sake, you know, it, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's about, it's it's about the, uh, it's really some of the closest, one of the closest things we've ever gotten to a real fly-on-the-wall portrait of being a, uh, being an artist, of being a performing yeah. artist, of being... A being an actor, what's it like to be an actor on a day to day basis on a film, yeah. playing a role? And you know, it just so happens that Jim Carrey is somebody who's committed to bring that role to life twenty four seven, and yeah. in that way, he's very similar to Andy Kaufman. I mean, it it really is not a, it's 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 not a happy accident that. Jim Carrey is the one who brought Andy Kaufman to life. It made sense. Yeah. It always was it makes sense. going yeah. to make sense because of who he was. And it's like, it's one of those things where when Jim Carrey was starting out, it's like, I wasn't a huge fan of him. Like, I wasn't really, yeah. 
I didn't really particularly love the broad comedies and stuff like that. I mean, there yeah. were things about them that were good, but it wasn't until later that it's like you really started to see him branch out and start to feel like you got to know him a little bit. I mean, Man on the Moon is definitely one of those things where you feel like you get to know Jim Carrey a little bit. I agree, yeah. I mean, yeah, just like like you, I did not like some of the broad comedies. Like, I, I mean, I like Dumb and Dumb are fine, and I like The Mask a lot. I yeah. don't like, I mean, I don't like Ace Ventura, though. I, I think both of them were just... Uh, it, yeah, bo- both those movies are just on my cup of tea. Which both, which both are like, how can I like that? It's like, it's like, well, <laughs> I, I don't know. They just both of those just never really appealed to me. Like, I like Liar and Liar, so I, I've always liked them like in small doses. Um, but Man on the Moon uh, is really where he shines. I think you know, even stuff like you know, Eternal Sunshine and all that. Yeah. And most recently. You know, most recently, he reunited with um, Michelle Gaudry, who directed Charles Sunshine, to do the Showtime series, Kidding. And it's fu- it's funny. And watching that show recently, Jim Carrey uh, plays a children's show host um, who deals with an exis- who deals with a midlife existential crisis, and he he sort of encompasses that classic Mister Rogers, you know, performance like a children's show host, but he also in some weird way, he also has sheds of the Andy Kaufman performance in there with the with the innocence and the goodness and the mm-hmm. that and that and that sort of optimism and humanity uh, that and that the Andy Kaufman performance seemed to portray. So it was interesting to see that come full circle, especially after seeing Jim and Andy, knowing who Jim Carrey is as a, as a person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I still haven't watched Kidding. I really want to see it because I I it's I, very good. I I love Michel Gondry. He's one of my favorite uh, filmmakers, and I I yeah I same. have become a I have grown to become a fan of Jim Carrey. And it's like I yeah I do, whenever he does something, I do look forward to seeing it. So it's like yeah, I I definitely do need to see Kidding at some point because I it's really yeah yeah. I mean, that that type of thing, and, you know, it's like I've seen the clip online where it's like they they basically show you the, they show you behind the scenes of how to make this really complicated shot in it. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it just blows my mind, and it's like, oh, I want to see this even more. But, uh, yep. yeah, it's, and, you know, I mean, this, this you know, the fact that I don't, you know, and I, I do want to say it's like the the fact that, the the fact that Man on the Moon works well and really well at times, but not great, is is not necessarily a it. I I wouldn't say it's the fault of, you know. I I think Alexander and Karaszewski and Foreman. I think they all did the best they could with it. Yes. Yeah. And I think there are things about what the work that they do in it is very good. I mean, it was yeah. a natural progression, I think, to for them to make this film after uh, People vs. Larry Flynn. And then yep. Karaszewski and Alexander doing this after Ed Wood. And sure. Mr. Foreman, you look at the films he's done, like Cuckoo's Nest and Amadeus. It, it makes sense within it does. all of their work why Andy Kaufman would be so interesting. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's and Foreman was somebody who passed away um, last year. Very recently, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and un- it's unfortunate because it's unfortunate after this that he, the Hollywood just wasn't you know in you know we we just talked about uh, Heaven's Gate and Michael Cimino. It's like Milo Foreman didn't really have much. He didn't really have too much of a career after this. You know, no, not really. It films didn't... of his after this, and it's a real shame. I don't think it had anything to do with the relatively muted response of this, but, I mean, it, it just, it, it boils down to another case where it's like Hollywood was changing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I Yeah, because the, he didn't make it, I mean, after Man the Moon, he didn't make another movie for another six years, or yeah. so, oh, no, seven years, rather, with, uh, with uh, Gloria's Ghost. Yeah. Uh and and I and I think he did one more film after that. Uh but that was it. Yeah, yeah. he yeah, because up in, because before, because up until Man on the Moon, 
he was churning out a movie every couple of years like any other filmmaker was uh, would, uh, would normally do. Um, so to see that lapse in uh, in, uh, in filmmaking, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, it's kind of it's kind of sad because he, like you said, he is a very respectable and also very talented filmmaker in his own right. Yeah. Um. Well, thank you very much for uh, coming on and discussing Man on the Moon with me. I really appreciate it. And this was, I was definitely oh, glad you. to uh, be able to revisit this and uh, for the purpose mm. of this podcast. And uh, yeah, it's if you haven't seen Man on the Moon and you're listening to this, I'm kind of surprised that you're listening to this. But Man <laughs> on the Moon is definitely, it, it, if, you haven't, if you have seen Man on the Moon, but you haven't seen Jim and Andy, I highly recommend that. It's on Netflix. It's yeah. a fantastic document on the creative process that Jim Carrey went through to bring Andy Kaufman to life. And yeah. it's something that I I think shows just how personal this uh this role was for him. Right. But uh yeah, thank you very much for joining me tonight, Chris, to uh talk about man. Oh thank it's you. Great to uh do so. Oh yeah, thank thank you uh, as always for inviting me. I'd like to thank Chris Esper for joining me tonight. It was a lot of fun talking to him about Andy Kaufman and Man on the Moon. If you haven't seen it, check out the amazing documentary on Netflix, Jim and Andy, The Great Beyond, which is a fly-on-the-wall look and as well as a retrospective look on Jim Carrey performing Andy Kaufman. I hope you enjoyed the discussion we had going on. There's going to be more about the movies of 1999 uh, at the Sonic Cinema Podcast, which you can find on YouTube, as well as www.sonic-cinema.com. Hit me up on patreon.com backslash Sonic Cinema for exclusive content and early access reviews, some of which are for 1999 movies. And uh, that's all for now. And uh, I've got a lot of different movies and a lot of different filmmakers and friends and uh, people to discuss movies with. So thank you very much for joining the Sonic Cinema Podcast. This is Brian Scuttle, and have a good day.